Today's panel, Imagining Addicts, offers us the opportunity to reflect on how American artists and actors have tried to create a well-rounded character for addicts in dramatic art forms like film, theater, radio plays, historic reenactments, and also works of historic fiction. Like many 18th century figures, Addicts leaves behind a slender written documentary re record, which offers both opportunities and challenges to those who want to portray him today. It's my honor to introduce our guest today, Mitch Kashoon, Professor Emeritus of History at Western Michigan University and author of First Murder of Liberty, Crispus Addicts and American Memory, perhaps the most definitive work on Addicts to date. We were fortunate to have Mitch as a key scholarly advisor for Reflecting Addicts. We also have here with us today Rashid Walters, a Boston-based social entrepreneur and historic reenactor who has played addicts in the Boston Massacre reenactment multiple years. We were also fortunate to have Rashid participating on an advisory group that helped us frame the content and the questions for reflecting addicts. Um, and joining us shortly will be Miranda Adekoje, a Boston-based playwright and author of I Am This Place, a new work on addicts commissioned by Revolutionary Spaces and produced by Plays in Place. Miranda had an unforeseen scheduling conflict and so she'll be joining us a little bit later in the discussion. So I wanted to start by saying, you know, each of you has spent a lot of time getting to know addicts. Um, so I want to begin in some way at the beginning of your relationship with him. So can you tell us when you met addicts, what drew, drew you to him? And then just by way of background for the audience, talk a little bit about the setting in which you told his story. <laughs> Who's going to go first? <laughs> All right, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, please. I guess I had a vague familiarity uh, with Crispus Addicts from uh, my elementary or secondary school years in terms of you know recognizing the name uh, as someone who died in the Boston Massacre. But uh, I didn't really set out to learn much about anything about him really until I was researching my first book, uh, which had to do with as a, a 19th century African-American emancipation celebrations. Um, uh, Black Americans were celebrating emancipation or freedom related events long before US emancipation. They celebrated the abolition of the slave trade, the, um, uh, the abolition of, uh, of slavery in Britain's uh, uh, colonies, especially in the West Indies. And they had annual celebrations of that event in particular on August 1st of West Indian emancipation. So I I'm reading the text of these orations and starting in the late 1840s, or actually starting in the late 1830s, but then much more frequently after the late 1840s, I'd see these references to Christmas Addicts, uh, where they used him as an example of black patriotism and, and sacrifice for the nation and so on. Uh, and, you know, the title of my book, First Martyr of Liberty, comes from the kind of language they use. So uh, that's, I, I became intrigued about learning more about addicts, and then I became really intrigued uh, when I found out that we really don't have much evidence about the man's life, yet there are all these stories that are, have been, had been developed about him, uh, you know, starting with the uh, African-American uh, abolitionists in the mid-19th century, and then, then going on from there, and we'll get into some of that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, like Mitch, um, I met addicts uh, in my elementary school days. I was being interested in history and um, I think the best way to um, articulate my my meaning of addicts is you know when you when you take a group photo um, and you receive the group photo the first person you look for in the group photo is yourself and studying American history and being a lover of history I looked for somebody that looked like me somebody that I could recognize in history that looked like myself. And that first introduction was Chris Fasadik's, um learning about the first um, man, but a man, a black man, African man of, and native man of, uh, in descent to, to die in one of the greatest uh, revolutions and causes in modern history. So that's my introduction to him. And, you know, I started reenacting um, as well, and 
when the opportunity presented itself to honor his legacy by portraying him, I definitely uh, made my best efforts to do that in the um, most historically accurate way. Great. I had the great pleasure of meeting addicts in person in the uh, in the person of Rashid at the reenactment last March before everything shut down. I was very uh, fortunate to be there and uh, sought him out afterwards so I could say hi. <laughs> Definitely, it's great to meet you too. And have you have an amazing book? I encourage everybody to collect when they get the chance. Definitely. Um, so one of the tricky things about interpreting any historic figure's story is trying to put your finger on the truth. So in Addicts's case, we have a bunch of different things. We have written documentary sources from the 18th century and also oral history that was handed down and recorded in the 19th century. Um, so historians naturally have different viewpoints on which of these sources is more reliable than others. Um, so Mitch, we've already had two Reflecting Addicts panels and we have gotten a ton of questions about Addicts' personal life. What did he look like? Where was he from? Who were his parents? Was he married and have children? So could you just give us a little bit of a sketch of what you think the most sort of widely agreed on facts are about Addicts' personal life, just so we can know him in that way? Really, as I you know, said at the outset, that there's really not much that we can know with a great deal of certainty about him. But um, it seems pretty clear from the circumstantial evidence, and, and really most of the all, almost all the evidence is, is circumstantial, that he was born in the Framingham area uh, in the early 1720s. Uh, 1723 is a date that uh, a lot of people, you know, place as his birth date. Um, and uh, he was probably born enslaved. Uh, we have a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest that his father was African born, a man named Prince Younger or Prince Jonar, that he goes by various sort of uh, permutations there, and, uh, who was uh, you know, African born, and a mother uh, whose name was uh, Nanny Peter Attics. Uh, who is was uh, resident in one of the towns uh, near Framingham or Natick, uh, the so-called praying towns uh, that had been established there a century earlier. Um, those two did seem to establish a household together. They had at least one daughter, uh, apparently, uh, and possibly two sons, one of them. Uh, I, I, I think there's a pretty good likelihood that uh, that they are the parents of, of Christmas addicts. Um, he, he escaped slavery uh, in 1750. Uh, we, we know this based on a, a runaway ad describing a man named Crispus, whose uh, physical description as a mulatto man, a man of mixed uh, race uh, from the Framingham area, a large man, well over six feet tall, uh, corresponds with the same description of Crispus Attucks we find in the accounts of the Boston Massacre in the newspaper accounts leading up to the trial and then in the trial itself. So pretty good certainty that that's the same guy, a large mulatto man named Crispus from Framingham. It's like, you know, it's not a very common name. Um, after he escaped slavery uh, in 1750, he worked for some part of that time as a sailor. We don't know if he uh, engaged in that right away. Um, but by 1770, when he shows up next in the historical record, and, and you know, there is that gap of 20 years where we know nothing. We don't know anything about him until we see him in Boston on March 5th, 1770. Um, and even then he's misidentified as a man named Michael Johnson uh, who was killed. And we don't know whether that means he used that name as an alias when he was in the Boston area. Uh, a lot of people assume that. I think it might be just as likely that there was some other guy named Michael Johnson who looked like him and someone identified him falsely or inaccurately at the time of his death. Mm. Um, but that was corrected fairly quickly within a week or so after the massacre. And really that's about all we know about Christmas Addicts. And I'll, I'll let Rashid fill in some of the gaps there uh, in terms of other kinds of speculation. Yeah. Rashid, is there anything else from like a personal life story point of view before we dig into the events of the massacre night that you would share? Oh, well, we can jump in. I could jump into uh, what Mitch was speaking about. I think uh, one thing 
that I find that I, I do and I'm very vocal about is the misconceptions of his role on that night. And um, a lot of historians have said, and even some reenactors have said, oh, well, he was shot because he was walking by. He was, um, you know, he just so happened to be in the crowd and got killed. And I think that it's very important for us to debunk those myths because I feel like those myths really devalue who he was and what he did. Because I think, you know, it's great to know the background of a person. Everybody wants to know a person's story, but what really made Attic special was what he contributed on that night and his role of, um, you know, the role could be disputed. Um, some would argue that he planned the event, but we could all agree that he led the men in um, down King Street to confront the soldiers. So it showed that his, he had some type of leadership role amongst his peers, especially as a man of African descent, that, that means something. When you're yep. you know, in a society where you know, people that look like you are viewed as the lowest form, not even human beings, and you're able to have the respect of your fellow men that they will uh, charge into danger with you leading them. So, you know, I think that uh, regarding addicts, I think it's very important to really debunk a lot of the um, mischaracteristics that are painted of him and his um, and what he contributed to protect and honor his legacy. Definitely. What do you, Rashid, what do you think brought him to King Street that night? What do you imagine his motivations might have been? Uh, you know, I feel as though soldiers and sailors and laborers and men who work, um, particularly in blue collar jobs, you, you know, you're, you're, on a, you're on a ship for months on end with another man that you got to rely um, on for everything. You've got to rely on this man. So if something happens to you, he could take care of you. You take care of him. You watch his back. So in those settings, you naturally as a sailor, you build some type of camaraderie with your fellow peer. You build some type of rapport. And, yeah. you know, the context was there, there are these guys who came from England. Um, they're not very nice people. And they're taking our jobs. They're making our lives difficult. Everything was fine until they got here. We have a common enemy. So at that point, you want to confront that common enemy. And everybody's being affected financially by this common enemy. So I believe that, uh, like every Bostonian um, in the city, the frustration is with the British. Um, you know, I know a lot of people would like to um, paint the picture. He was going there to die for liberty. He didn't know nothing about liberty. He didn't know anything about freedom. The only freedom he knew was escaping enslavement. But the whole political ideology of, you know, this tax is unfair, those were for educated men. Uh, of the time, not for the labor, the laboring men who are probably illiterate, can't read the newspaper. So I believe he came out that night um, because again, it's a common enemy. They're taking our jobs, they're occupying our city. We're frustrated with them. There needs to be something that needs to be done. Mitch, what do you think brought in there that night? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with a, a lot of what R Rashid said. I think it's very important that, that we recognize Attic's uh, being in that category of a working class person and a sailor. And there's been a lot of great scholarship uh, written about sailors in the 18th century and, and uh, uh, yeah, a book by Jeffrey Bolster that came out in the late 90s on African-American sailors in particular. And uh, yeah, some of the things he's saying there, you know, racism didn't, didn't disappear when you, you know, set your foot on, on the, uh, the deck of a ship. But because these men did have their lives in each other's hands and you had to rely on that person next to you, this was a dangerous uh, craft that they were plying out there on the uh, high seas and bad weather and so on. So, you know, trust, respect, hard work and, 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 and getting to know people in that intimate way, uh, I think gives addicts a very cosmopolitan worldview in, in a sense. Uh, yeah, we don't know if he was literate or not. Uh, a lot of sailors were. 
Um, but we have no idea uh, if Attucks uh, uh, was literate, let alone uh, you know some of the mythology that's grown around him that he was you know well versed in political philosophy and and so on. I also tend to agree with with uh, Rashid there that you know, we we don't have the evidence of that. And uh, you know sailors have a reputation of being kind of a rough and tumble group of people, and 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 there were certainly run-ins with. The British. I mean, the practice of impressment on the high seas, where the British would basically stop a vessel and force people off of that vessel to come. You know, if they needed to fill out their own crew on a, a British naval vessel, uh, they'd get people from another ship and and force them, impress them into service. And again, there's no evidence that 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 happened to Attucks at any point in his life as a sailor, but it may have. And it, even if it hadn't. Uh, he would have shared that sort of anti-British, anti-naval uh, sentiment that a lot of sailors did. There was a major riot in Boston in the 1840s, the Knowles riot over this, this practice. So, um, you know, what brought him into the street? I don't know. The leadership question is, is kind of an interesting one. Um, I, I don't see him as in any way an organizer of that mob. I don't think the mob was organized. I think what, yeah, the way, when I envision what Attucks was doing, there's one uh, piece of evidence that, that, or at least one account, places him in a tavern um, uh, when the events were starting to take place. And you know, the ringing of the bells that, that brought lots of people into the streets, I'm thinking that probably brought, brought Attucks into the streets. But once he got into the streets and got a sense of what was going on, he was definitely not an innocent bystander. Um, you yeah, know, that's uh, almost without question based on witness testimony. He was, uh, you know, identified as leading 20 or 30 sailors up Cornhill and had a couple of big clubs in his hand and he gave one to another sailor and, and he's, he's in the front of that crowd. Um, uh, he's not, you know, leaning against the building in the background. He's right in front and one witness, we only have one witness account, has him taking his club and striking at a British soldier and either hitting the soldier or maybe his gun, uh, which precipitated the, the firing of, of those British guns. So, yeah, not innocent bystander. Whether he had a, a leadership role, I'm not sure what that means, but he was certainly rallying people. And, and the idea that yeah, as a person of color, as a black man, and he wasn't the only black man, person of African descent in that crowd that night. Mm -hmm. um, several of the witnesses were as well that were called at the trial and some who weren't called at the trial. So uh, the fact that he was claiming his place to use the public streets to make some sort of political statement, not about revolution or independence, because as Rashid said, Nobody was really thinking about that in 1770, but a political statement about uh, opposition to the British presence. Uh, that you know, he he was a man who was confident, uh, aggressive, perhaps, uh, probably knew how to handle himself in a fight, as you know, sailors have that reputation, and wasn't going to back down. So it, it it gives us some suggestions about what his what kind of personal characteristics he may have had. Right. So I think it's really helpful to get those broad strokes of Attucks's life. Um, and we sort of talked about a couple different ways of knowing. Um, are there other sources that both of you turn to as you try to understand the arc of his life? What were some of the interesting resources that you turn to to understand him more? Well, uh, I think Mitch is somebody I turn to, uh, to kind of get those get that understanding because I, I never really um my interest wasn't really in the personal life um knowing who his parents were knowing if he had a wife and children you know knowing what he probably liked to eat or things that he liked to do or i i, I didn't really have much interest until you know I, I read mitch's book and i was like oh okay this is some this background that I'm getting about him is is, is intriguing, but I, I had more interest on uh, his role on on the night of March fourth. Uh, excuse me, March fifth. How could I forget that, right? <laughs> March March fifth. I, I, you know, just understanding his role, and I think you know one of the most fascinating things um, that I don't think is widely shared is how he died. The last position. He was leaning over a, a stick, 
looking at the British soldiers and and in in my mind when I portray him, I I firmly believe he was ready to die at that present moment. I, I don't think that at that time, you know, you're leaning, you just, you know, you 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 know, especially after throwing bricks and and sticks and all types yeah. of other items at these soldiers, you, you know that this may be it, but, you know, as a man, uh, a black man in that time, you know, what do you have to really lose dying here? You know, yeah. so that's, um, I think when, we, you know, me digging into addicts, the personal life, again, I'm thankful for Mitch and many other great historians and scholars who have started to uncover that. But I mean, me personally, I've, you know, really been studying more so the accounts of what took yeah. place that night and studying kind of his role. So that's where I stand on that. Great. Mitch, are there other interesting sources that you've turned to? Uh, yeah, for sure. And again, you know, I'll, I'll mention again, those uh, just sources on the context of understanding uh, the lives of sailors and dock workers and other, you know, working class people and lives of, of people of color in New England in particular. Uh, although, you know, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack here uh, to his his life story it, we really don't know if literally if, if he ever set foot in the town of boston prior to those days before uh march 5th 1770 there's no evidence placing him in boston you know he he apparently grew up in the framingham area so it's certainly plausible uh, that he had spent time in boston before but uh, we just don't know um there are some some of the sources that i looked at um in trying to, I, I, you know, again, my, my focus wasn't so much on putting together a biography of addicts. I don't know if that's really possible. <laughs> uh, but uh, I wanted to understand what was knowable about his life. And uh, it, it seems that that rough outline that I, I tried to give at the beginning is about what we know. There are a couple of uh, 19th century histories of Framingham that I think are very useful in piecing together the framework of his possible life as an enslaved person there. Um, one was written by a, a man named Barry in the 1840s, another by a man named Temple in the 1880s. And it's interesting that the, the one in 1840 has a lot of contextual information, mentions Prince Younger, um, and the, the family into which uh, that man was enslaved and, and some of his, his dealings. And apparently this guy, Prince Younger, lived a long, long life. He lived into the 1790s um, and was well known in the Framingham area. But the 1840s, I think it was 1847 book, does not mention Crispus Attucks at all. The 1887 book does mention Crispus Attucks along with all of those other uh, connections and places him as... Uh, the, the son of, of uh, uh, Prince uh, Younger and, and Nan Nanny Peter Attucks. Um, so th those sources were very helpful. And you know, the timing of uh, why one book mentions Attucks and the other one doesn't is because Attucks really disappeared from the historical record almost completely, uh, basically within a couple of years after his death, uh, until the 1830s and 40s, when a few uh, black abolitionists started to uncover information about him and put him to use, put his story to use for their own cause of abolition and, and pursuing citizenship rights. So by the 1880s, he, his name was well known and, and mm -hmm. his, uh, uh, his role in the Boston Massacre was much better known than it was in say 1840. Um, uh, so sources like that are useful uh, and uh, I, I think they can help us piece together plausible stories uh, about Crispus Attucks. Of course, the, you know, the, the, the records of the trial and, and so on uh, uh, give you a lot of information as well. Uh, but Great. Okay. Well, thanks to both of you for kind of laying the historical groundwork, and now we're going to sort of switch over into talking about some of the challenges of bringing him to life. Um, so I think one of the things I wanted to ask was telling any kind of story in a concise way requires an act of curation. So some things you're going to really bring to the center of the story and other things you're potentially reluctantly going to leave on the cutting room floor. So I'd be interested to know from both of you, when you think about Attucks' story and you're trying to think about it from a dramatic narrative point of view, what are the most evocative pieces of information that keep coming back to you that you sort of center the story or the narrative around? 
let Mitch take that one first, and I'll come right behind him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I mean, I think again, basically looking at this contextual material, um, if if we have his birth date accurate uh, in the early eighteen, uh, I'm sorry, seventeen twenties, then we can see. Um, him uh, as a man of 27 years old when that that runaway ad is placed in 18 or seven, like switching centuries 1750 um so he was he was an adult uh and he he knew himself and i, I think we have to look at that act of self-liberation as something that we know about him uh we don't know what his experience as an enslaved person was it was he quote unquote well treated um it, some of the, the lore that comes from those 19th century uh, local histories suggests that uh, his possible father, Prince, was a favored slave of uh, Colonel Buck, Buckminster uh, in the Framingham area and had special privileges. And, and some of the, the, the un, unconfirmed stories that have grown up around Christmas Attics also suggested he had some favorite status that he was able to travel on the behalf of his his master's business but it, there's no real evidence confirming that that's just uh, as you talked about earlier oral sources and and hearsay um but the act of self-liberation uh, whether he was well treated and favored or or not um it tells you something about who this man was and and, and again the the life of uh, a sailor Gives you some sense of who he was but that moment of self-liberation is, is if you want to talk about evocative moments that's one that i think uh, perhaps you could envision putting him in on a path of freedom seeking um, where you go with that in terms of why he did what he did on the night of march 5th that's where you get into a lot of speculation but i'll, I'll leave it at that i guess yeah. rashid what do you what do you circle back around to um, I think that, you know, one thing that's very fascinating, um, him being an enslaved person and understanding, um, you know, what that feels like to not have rights, to not be a human being, um, you know, to be on the level of an animal, understanding that oppression and then perhaps escaping that oppression and entering into a society in which that oppression still exists. And then getting to witness that oppression to people that are not of African descent, because to, to a certain degree, the British um, coming into Boston was oppression. Many of the townspeople mm -hmm. felt it was oppression. And having these unfair taxes put on the colonists without any representation is oppression. So now, those feelings of, 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 of oppression is being re-invoked in him. And I think, you know, what we may wonder and think that he was thinking, wow, I escaped and ran away from this sort of slavery to enter into another form of oppression. And, you know, I already ran away and that's a form of resistance. Running away is one of the forms of resisting in slavery. And now my other form of resistance is I'm going to stand up to these guys. I'm going to take my club and I'm going okay. to go down with my fellow sailors and we're going to go confront this oppression. So this is another instance um, that we know of because it could have been other instances when he was a sailor, but this is another instance that we know of, of him standing up to some type of form of oppression and he, and he stood up to it and gave his life. So I think that's something that's very, very interesting about him and his legacy and his mentality. Um, thank you, Rashid. I just want to welcome Miranda. So, thank you. <laughs> um, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we're really delighted to have you here. Um, so, Miranda, we're right in the middle of a question about how, you know, telling any story requires an act of curation and um, putting some things to the center and letting other things fall away. Yeah. So, I was curious to know, um, as you've been thinking about Attic's story, what are sort of some of the central evocative things that you return to over and over again when you think about his story? Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> so good to be here. Um, so, I have completed um, the my, my piece, I Am This Place, and um, that was an, definitely a curation of parts of Crispus Attic's history. 
Um, and I know, and for me in writing it, you can't, I couldn't take it all in. Cause if I take it all in, I wouldn't be able to write a 20 minute piece with two <laughs> actors. Like you just can't. Um, so you have to kind of, yeah, I had a pull, I had a thought, which in learning more about his life turned into a plan and an outline. And then I, I fleshed that out um, and was able to do it that way. So I think the things that I really resonated with were his, his um, indigenous roots, and his African roots, because those are that's, those are facts that we that we knew. Um, and then I really I looked into the indigenous experience of folk at the time, and um, the fact that his mom was indigenous um, really helped me to have a through way to what these relationships would be like. Because I'm I'm saying okay, I have a mother, I have a son, um, I have what the native experience was, um, and rather than going forward past. Um, March 5th, I went back. So um, I, I, I imagined his grandparents and his, his actually his great grandparents, his grandparents and his own mother and, and trace his life that way. And <clears throat> through doing that, I mean, I wouldn't say anything, there was anything that I didn't pay attention to, but the actual event, the what happened on March 5th, because there's so much speculation about it and we don't know, I would say that was not my focus just because I didn't want to make that up. I really wanted to kind of root him and ground him in the experiences of these two um, oppressed groups so that by the time we got to the event on March 5th, it feels like the whole play has been leading up to that. So um, that was my focus and it was really just eye-opening as someone who was born and raised in Boston, like lives in Massachusetts to learn about the indigenous histories and the different things that happened in the, the, those movements was, was, was amazing for me because what I know, and I don't even feel like I know this that well, is, my, is the African ancestry and the African experience. Um, I'm more familiar with that. So learning about the indigenous experience and, and those, the movements that happened therein and the revolts and how, what it was like to be in Christmas Attic's time where Africans and, and the indigenous folk were, they were, walking around together. It was Africans, indigenous, and, and, and the whites, you know what I mean? So to know that that was the, that was the um, currency at the time was just eye-opening for me. And, you know, the idea of like um, the, the distinct, the distinguishing a person of color, like I didn't know that the term person of color came from distinguishing like in the indigenous folk from Africans, like these are people of color, but they're not African slaves. So all of those things to me were so interesting and I wanted to really root him through his mother and his grandmother and his great grandmother in, in, in uh, traditions and um, this, just have the seed of this revolutionary oppositional spirit come in through those experiences. So that was kind of my, my in and anything else, because there's a lot of history about, you know, the American Revolution and what was going on in Massachusetts at the time. But I decided to do the opposite of what I've been taught you know, I said, I'm going go to, back. To, yeah, yeah, stop and go back. Like, actually, I'm not going to pay attention to this white, which is a, mostly a white male narrative. I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm going to pay yeah. attention to what actually the experiences and create a story around the experiences of the indigenous and, and Africans who were oppressed at the time. Yeah. So Miranda, could you comment a little bit, because the starting point that you took in a way in the play, hopefully this isn't too much of a spoiler alert, was to like take it all the way back to King Philip's War. Um, yes, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about your decision to do that? Because I thought it was really interesting that you went that far back. <laughs> sure, sure. So I did go to see the exhibit and um, I, I, now this again is all speculation, but there was some, uh, a, a gentleman named John Atuk who um, <clears throat> was, it, it was record, his name was recorded as part of um, King Philip's War. And I thought that that was really interesting because I was like, okay, I can do something with that, <laughs> right? That, that's, it's, it's a link, right? So I created a story around John and Took and his wife, who was at the time, you know, carrying, well, who would be Christmas Alex's grandmother. So I, I, used I went far I went that far back because there was a little bit of a link that gave me a little clue in like a, okay yeah. so where were they at this time like when King Philip's war was going on what was happening to the um, indigenous folk that, that were in that place and there was lots happening you know there was Deer Island happening there were the praying town so so it gave me a link and an in 
that helped me to, you know, propelled me through the generations. And eventually I got, when I got to him, we were, I, it was great. Cause it's like, great. This, this piece can end where mostly history kind of begins with that first that mm-hmm. shot, you know? So, so yeah, so it was, it was, it was fascinating. It's wonderful to be able to use the context of the time to kind of ground these fictional characters. Um, yeah. That was a real, that was actually quite fun for me. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings me to my next question, which is sometimes the historical record might not be quite enough to make someone feel like a well-rounded character or give them kind of a clear narrative arc that an audience would resonate with. And I think in those circumstances, it's sort of up to the author or the actor to figure out how to fill in the gaps. So Miranda and Rashid, I'd like to hear from both of you about when you've tried to fill in the gaps with your own imagination what's been your interconnecting tissue there that's helped you think about who this individual was as a whole person and not just the bits and pieces we know? A good question. Um, I feel like I'm not an actor by trade. Um, You know, that's just something I would, uh, I kind of do as a small hobby, uh, reenacting. But when, when I'm, I don't really imagine much when it comes to addicts um, in particular. I would, you know, try to analyze his mindset by using, as I mentioned in the previous question, by kind of using context clues. But I think, uh, you know, the the most important service, in my humble opinion, that I could do for addicts is just portray what he did that night. Uh, Because that is um, what really this is why he's remembered uh, for his heroic, uh, his heroic actions, his martyrdom, um, his sacrifice that night. That's, I, I believe, what, you know, has been kind of the foundational building block of him. So in my opinion, that's kind of what I focus on. So I don't really imagine much besides, you know, yeah. just kind of stick to <laughs> what I did. know on him. <laughs> yeah. For, for me, um, <clears throat> I, my my entryway to any character as a writer as a playwright is through is through the relationships that they have um because i think therein we find themes that we can relate to today mother son father son mother father you know husband wife those 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 relationships that i i was able to build that therein lied all lay everything that i needed to create the his his arc and also, like, knowing what happens at the end, it was easy to kind of tie back. Um, I think that it's really important to think about the little details that, that can, it, we don't miss them in life, but I think we, writers and those who especially write for the stage and screen need to exalt them so that people remember, oh yeah, you know, these are real characters. Like, that's something that I do. So that was a big thing for me with the Attic story is, um, you know, talking about, his mother talks about him as a baby and what that's like, like remembering that this man who was for, is forever memorialized as this, a man who died in a certain way was once a little baby that someone took care of, you know, that someone, you know, um, whose feet used to pad on the ground, you know? And, and I think those, those details are really important because they keep, they kept him for me from being a symbol like this, the symbol, which he is, and he has a lot of, um, yeah. you know, a lot of significance in what he symbolizes, but it kept him from being that to being a real person who, you know, had these relationships and was sad and, you know, disappointed. And, 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 and I think the relationships that I created around him helped to delineate who he was. And, and that was really affecting for me because, again, I didn't know we don't know a lot about who he was as a person. And so as a writer, I'm not going to go down too, too far down a rabbit hole with no, cause I, it is a, he is a historical um, character. He's not just a fictional character. So yeah, I had to, you know, I, I just, that doesn't, that didn't appeal to me cause I'd have to stop every page and be like, Ooh, how am I going too far? You know, but the relationships creating real moments with, him and other human beings and the people that like birthed him or loved him that that's where I found um the character had picked up a lot of steam and started to really grow yeah 
So I'm picking up a few questions from the chat box that sort of touch back to some of the um, historical stuff that we're talking about before we forge on a little bit. I want to see if we can try to answer some of these. Um, so can you tell us more about daily life for praying Indians in the 1720s? Was Nanny Pederatics free or enslaved? How did her son come to be enslaved? If she was free, was he taken from her into slavery? So Mitch, can you help field some of these? A little bit. I, I, I really uh, uh, don't know much about the day-to-day -day lives of the so-called praying Indians. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that part of it aside. But in terms of uh, uh, Crispus Attucks's uh, plausible family of Prince Younger and, and Nanny Peter Attucks, um, yeah, the questions there I think are really interesting. Um, was she free or enslaved? Well, it, it you know, native people were enslaved uh, in, in, in Massachusetts at this time, um, but not all were. And her own status, I did find evidence that there was a, a marriage recorded between Nanny Peter Attucks and Prince Younger uh, in, I think it was 1737, I want to say. So this is, would have been like 14 years after Christmas Attucks' birth. So that raises questions about, well, were they cohabiting? At that time, did perhaps maybe, perhaps was did he have a different father other than Prince Younger? Um, but let's assume that they were they were his parents. They didn't get married till 1737. So Prince Younger is identified in historical records as an enslaved person uh, and a man of African descent, uh, African birth, in fact. Um, but his wife, being of native ancestry, and we're not sure if she was completely native or if she was also a, a mixed race person, um, she may or may not have been enslaved, but in the 1740s, when the person who owned Prince Younger under the laws of the day uh, died and his uh, estate went into probate, there was listed among his property, someone who was listed as, I, I believe I have this accurate, a Negro woman named Nanny. So, at this time, and she was valued at you know, some number of uh, English pounds. So there was a value placed on her. So this implies that she was his property at that time, that she was an enslaved person. Did she choose to give up her freedom when she married Prince Younger? Did she uh, uh, sort of de facto become a Negro by virtue of her marriage to an African man? Uh, th th those raise some interesting questions about identity and, and where that line is, where a person of color uh, yeah. fits on that continuum. Uh, so, so that's a kind of an interesting uh, thing that, and, uh, and someone else asked about the, the name Crispus. Yes, um, someone else said that. Based on, on the poking around that I did in uh, the, the various biblical uh, uh, texts and, and, uh, and commentaries, there was a, a person in the Bible named, in the New Testament named Crispus who was associated with the Apostle Paul. And I can't remember now where it was, if it was in Corinth or one of the cities that he, he wrote his many letters uh, to or from. Uh, that there was a person there who was a person who was uh, very pious and he was uh, something like the only person in that community to really follow uh, the teachings of, of Jesus. Uh, so that, that's the only, that's the biblical reference that I know of to Crispus. Uh, people have other theories about, you know, that, where that name came from, but I think that's probably the most likely. So I'll leave it at that for now, I guess. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so, um, so we were talking a little bit about, you know, how an author sort of like fills in the blanks of character. Um, and so Mitch, a bunch of your work focuses on addicts in American memory. And you also look at how addicts was portrayed in dramatic settings like radio plays, film scripts, works of historic fiction. So you've heard a little bit from Rashid and Miranda about how, you know, they see his arc and life story. What were some of the other ways that he was presented in different tales from different authors? Well, you know, e even aside from you know, fictional accounts, uh, you know, he was he was portrayed in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, from the beginning, when John Adams is is defending the British soldiers at the trial, he 
portrays addicts as a, a mixed race outsider, uh, a troublemaker who was there to disrupt the social order, who was using violence uh, against these uh, troops who had then no choice but to fire. And it was an effective defense strategy. And that characterization of addicts persists to this day and, and you know, has its echoes all throughout the past 250 years of Alex being, or addicts being a, a basically a villain, not a hero, uh, because he was a threat to the social order. And this, this kind of pops up in, in time periods in American history more when there are threats to the social order uh, that are happening. Like in the 1830s, there are a lot of people in the streets uh, fighting for working people's rights, abolitionists, uh, women's rights activists starting to take, the, take to the streets. And there, there's a great fear about social order. You see this again in the 1880s and 90s when there are a lot of you know, uh, immigrants who have anarchist or socialist tendencies and there's a lot of labor organizing and people in the streets, there's a bad connotation there. So in, in times like that, addicts appears as a, a more villain in, in a lot of accounts by more conservative uh, spokespersons. But in, in, in terms of theater, theatrical productions, uh, fiction uh, and so on, um, the first play that I'm aware of that focuses specifically on Christmas Addicts was by uh, an African-American playwright, really a seminal African-American playwright uh, named Willis Richardson in the early 1930s. I uh, had a play uh, by, uh, titled Christmas Addicts. Um, there were other plays produced uh, about addicts in the, the 1940s and uh, the 1980s, and they, they sort of pop up here and there. Um, and those typically have the kind of uh, narrative arc that black abolitionists used as early as the, the 1840s and 50s, that he, here was this man who was uh, uh, oppressed as an enslaved person, liberated himself. Uh, he was a, a good, true American. He was loyal hearted. He was brave and strong and courageous and kind and well read and religious. And you, know, you have this really real construction of this, this idealized character of a man. And he made the ultimate sacrifice. He was a dedicated American patriot. This is the, the storyline that's the most sort of consistent, persistent one. Yeah. Dedicated American compatriot saw that there was a cause larger than himself and was willing to sacrifice his life for that cause. And, and that's really the way most of these characterizations over the years have presented them. And that, that goes for these radio plays. They first started appearing uh, right around 1940. And then throughout the 1940s, there were several different uh, radio broadcasts that, that tried to present African Americans in a positive light. Uh, and focused on African-American heroes in, in American history. Um, and they typically followed that line as well. And, and you know, and, and they really did make up a lot of stuff because they just didn't have the, <laughs> the details to, to work with. Films, to my knowledge, there's never been a film made uh, featuring, you know, focusing on Christmas Addicts' life. There were attempts. Again, around 1940, there was a, a gentleman, an African-American sort of uh, entrepreneur in the theatrical world named Earl Dancer. Um, he was uh, affiliated with Warner Brothers. He had a play script. He made some assertions that he had Warner Brothers interested in producing this play. Supposedly, he had Paul Robeson ready to play the part of Christmas Addicts. <laughs> would it, that that would be cool or what? That'd be cool. Um, <laughs> but it never it never happened uh, for uh, reasons that I'm not clear on. Another black actor named James Edwards in the 1950s was talking about trying to get an addicts movie made uh, that never got any legs. And then you know the cover of my book uh, and it's an image that you use in Revolutionary Spaces in the the reflecting addicts exhibit uh, is a, a a movie poster. I'll, I'll grab it. It's, it's, this is part of a movie poster uh, that was uh, a movie that was supposedly, uh, I can't, can't figure yeah, out how you get it centered, there we go, of, uh, of Christmas Addicts uh, in 1973, 1974. The, uh, the movie was, uh, I think, going to be titled just Christmas. And this was a, they, they actually got far enough to have a, a professional promotional poster done by a well-respected uh, graphic artist named Robert Frankenberg. And that's the image here 
which if you think about the early 70s and you look at this bare chested, really chiseled Crispus Attucks, literally flying through the air, his feet are not touching the ground to where the British troops, I'm thinking this was going to be a black exploitation film, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but I don't know. I actually, I actually made contact to get the rights for that image with the person who was the president of the production company back in the early 70s. He's still alive, living in Boca Raton. Uh, Elliot Geisinger, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, he had no recollection of the movie and how it uh, fell apart, but it, it, was, it was never produced. But apparently it got farther than any other one. So th there's a, a really interesting kind of range of ways that he's been presented, but typically it's that uh, very uh, loyal, patriotic, brave, uh, sacrificing, almost Christ-like martyrdom of Crispus Attucks that's uh, the, the, the most typical narrative that, that you see. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask this group, um, if a Crispus Attucks movie were being made today, um, who would you cast in the role? Since I think Paul Robeson's probably not available right now. <laughs> oh, gosh. Maybe Denzel, this all makes sense. Around the same age. Oh, mm, Denzel. Gotta be Idris Elba. So the right age, he's a big guy. Yeah. <laughs> Idris Elba? <laughs> I'm just trying, I'm just actually trying to think. I would say, probably maybe a John Boyega. He's like the mm. the British actor who, you know, I know I know he'd give it all his, his gusto. I would say that. Because he's got <laughs> he's a bit younger and he, he could grow into that moment. So <laughs> what, what about what about Rashid? I, hey, <laughs> hey. I'll, I'll take that. I'll Good take point. that for sure. Definitely. Good point. Hmm. Um Cool. All right. Um, so just going back to the chat box for a couple seconds here. Um, so has there been an attempt to compile a listing of original court documents mentioning Crispus Attucks? So um, I think the Mass Historical Society has a bunch of the um, depositions sitting on their website, but Mitch, you probably know more than I do about this. There were, there were uh, some compilations. We, we don't have a literal transcript of the trial. We, a lot of people refer to the transcript of the trial, but it's really uh, you know, notes that were taken after the fact that rather than things that were taken down verbatim as the trial was progressing. But those were published as early as, oh gosh, I'm not sure if they were done in the 1770s. I think the earliest ones might have been done in the 1770s and they get, kept getting reprinted for decades afterwards. Um, and, and again, the depositions are, 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 are they're housed at Mass Historical. Uh, so um, yeah, that's, those are the, the main ones that I, I know of. Okay. Um, so someone else writes, I would imagine that Attucks was a hero of the left. I think he was mentioned in Earl Robinson's Ballad for Americans. What more can you say about this history? So I don't know about that one. Mitch, do you know about that? I'm not familiar with the Earl Robinson, uh, Robinson piece. Um, I, I would say, you know, his status as a working class person um, uh, has over the years made him uh, uh, something of a hero to the left. You know, a couple of historians, uh, uh, Marcus Redeker and uh, uh, Peter Leinebaugh have, have written a lot about the experiences of sailors of the cross-racial lines in the, the, uh, the 18th century and the extent to which they were a sort of catalyst for revolution in a lot of ways. And they, they write about addicts as part of that revolutionary cadre of, of uh, sailors and working people that, uh, you know, that puts more emphasis on their role in moving uh, yeah. the, the US uh, toward revolution than say, you know, the, you know, the philosophers. And you know, interesting, uh, w. E. B. Du Bois, in the 1930s, I think, referred to addicts. I can't remember the exact quotation, but made some kind of reference to addicts as a representative of, of working people. Um, and I think at one point in New York City, I believe that back in the 30s, also New York barbers, uh, African American barbers, wanted to, uh, I, I guess, have. A, a universal holiday on March 5th, 
Christmas Addicts Day. So yeah, there's there's definitely uh, a lot of instances where where leftist uh, working class uh, kinds of uh, of folks identify with addicts. Um, and a great question here too. Um, so uh, someone would like to know, <clears throat> Rashida Miranda, how do you think about addicts' relationship with fellow Bostonians? So, did, does, so the question is, does he get the sense that Crispus felt alone or part of a genuine community of people who respected him? I saw that, that question. That is a really, really good question. Um, I, I crafted Crispus's relationship with his mother. Um, that was like the main relationship that I crafted in my, um, in my piece. But um, something actually when I, I sent a draft to Mitch for his um, help and guidance and um, something that he touched on was the fact that these sailors, what's interesting about sailors is that, you know, they, they were part of Boston, obviously, but they were sailing. So they were seeing other cultures, they were seeing other places. Um, and I, I imagine that the way that worked on Crispus, knowing that his father wasn't from, originally from um, the colonies, um, is that it, it opens you up to, it would, it would have opened him up to how other places do things. But then also when you come back to your home base, you can look at it with a critical eye or with a, just a, with a, a difference, like, cause it's, you're not there. And at the time we obviously have to remember there weren't like airplanes, you weren't going everywhere. Very few people left their, you know, home, like village church, like it, everybody was very, um, had to stay put. So, so I imagine that with him traveling and going and then coming back, he's probably came back every, a different man every time to see what was still going on in Massachusetts and Boston. So for me, I, I, I thought that, um, I don't, I didn't know what his relationships were when he, when he left, um, and, and whether he had a brotherhood with his fellow sailors, I know, but I do know that there was some camaraderie there that wasn't happening on land just because these men of different races are all kind of on this boat. So I think I read that in your piece, Mitch, <laughs> um, just about that, the way, um, the mini society on, in, for, of sailors worked and it was different, right? Uh, it was different than how things worked on land. So there's that, that relationship brotherhood, but then, you know, I, I, I would think coming back to Boston because he was also a, a runaway. Um, I, I would wonder how many relationships he could really have where he was truly himself. Um, so yeah, so he, he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a mystery in that to me, which is why I had to make a relationship the relationship with his mother. So I had to use real life things that happened to between mothers and sons, just because that's something that I could, you know, I had a foothold in, but in terms of who he knew and how he moved once he left, once he ran away, um, I don't know. It's, it's pretty much all speculation. Yeah. Rashid, what do you think? Did, were Bostonians standing with him? Did he feel like he was part of that community or not? Um, you know, this is the 1700s being a black man, you're not viewed as a human being, you're viewed um, literally as an animal. So, you know, obviously, um, you knew your place. Um, unfortunately, you knew that you, you couldn't, you know, really, I mean, it's the same thing with classism. Um, even people who were in that blue collar um, avenue knew that, you know, I'm not really part of society, I have my place in society. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the brotherhood that he probably established with the sailors, I think that, you know, one thing is for certain, I mean, I wouldn't go out and die with or die for people I don't like. Um, I won't go out into danger amongst men I don't really trust. Um, so I think he has some type of relationship and camaraderie with some of the fellow sailors and obviously with other people uh, that were of African descent, um, you know, more than likely you have similar experiences and could understand each other. But, you know, obviously as an African person of descent in Boston at that time, I wouldn't assume that he had much uh, allies outside of those groups. Okay. Um, I want to just briefly uh, caution against assuming that that he was a part of the community in Boston. I mean, before Miranda joined us, I made the point that we really don't know if he ever set foot in Boston before that day. He is, you know, originally from Massachusetts, but, and 
you know, at the time of uh, the massacre, the newspaper accounts uh, identified his home base as uh, New Providence in the Bahamas. So in terms of uh, having a home base, apparently, uh, if we can trust that one, that, that source, it was there. Uh, and again, he was a cosmopolitan man. He was treated in Boston as a stranger. I mean, when he died, he was in, in uh, his, body, uh, his body and uh, Cal James Cal Caldwell's body were moved to Faneuil Hall, not because they were lying in state, as some sources have put it, but because they had no family there to prepare their bodies for burial. And they went into this public, they were set, put, sent to this public space to be prepared for burial. Uh, so it's, it, I, I am pretty clear in my own mind that he was not part of the Boston community. He was an outsider, he was a stranger, and I, that would sort of assume that he didn't really have uh, allies there or, or feel a part of that community of that town. Um, Rashid, question for you from the chat. Um, what's the process that you and the reenactors go through to prepare for the reenactment? Do you have rehearsals? Do the actors change each year? Um, and do you feel like you've uh, improved in your role as Crispus through the years? And how have you gotten better? Um, yeah, so I could speak more toward when we did the, um, the last reenactment, which was huge. Um, it was the uh, 250th. And it was a big deal for, for uh, a lot of us. And, um, you know, we train, I mean, when I first started, we had a rehearsal. But as the years went on, we didn't really do the rehearsal because we kind of, everybody knew what they were supposed to do. Because um, there are different layers. You have an inner mob, which are the guys who get shot. So, you know, obviously, you already know what to do and the safety precautions you have to take. Obviously, we're dealing with actual uh, muskets so and this is not you know uh, pretty much something to play around with so we had rehearsals but I think this year we had rehearsals I sat on the board this year also because I think it was very important for this particular reenactment to make sure that addicts was portrayed properly and that the story was told so we had a lot of meetings um, obviously this year we were very very serious about clothing and making sure that guys were a hundred percent uh, historically accurate. I mean, no facial hair. I, you know, obviously at that time, facial hair was not smiled upon. So, you know, mm -hmm. those small little tidbits were things that we focused on, making sure that everybody looked apart. Everybody had their kits that were of the um, of the era. Have I gotten better? Yes, uh, I've gotten better through studying um, the actual accounts of how things went down. So, just understanding, you know which side of the building am I coming from? Because the side of the building that I'm coming from was the side that he came from. And, you know, just the small details, when I, when I am shot, where do I lie? Where, because obviously, you know, the, the, the massacre happened in the intersection. You know, we're just on a small piece of it. But, you know, again, trying to be as historically accurate as possible. Um, with even down to the accounts of what clothes that, they, that he potentially wore that night, you know? so. Yes, there's a lot of preparation that we put in to make sure that this is as close to historically accurate as possible. Great. Um, so other quick question from the chat. Um, so it was interesting that his Addicts' body was sent to Faneuil Hall after his death, um, but wouldn't his parents have been notified about his death? Um, so, and what about the funeral where 10,000 people came out for the service and burial? Would his parents not have been present? So, this, Mitch, was a ma yeah, this is a massive event. I mean, the funeral, again, 10,000 persons, it's, we're talking about like two thirds of the, the town of Boston, apparently, uh, if those accounts are, are accurate, we're, we're out there for this uh, funeral procession and, and the funeral itself. Um, we don't know, or I don't know at least, uh, if his mother was still alive at this point, but his father, again, presuming Prince Younger was his father, um, he was still alive. He lived in the 1790s. And that's, that's one of the sort of disconnects with that narrative about his family background. Why were there, there no commentaries in 1770 from Framingham? I'm, I, maybe folks who do Framingham history know of some things that I missed but I'm not aware of any commentaries from Framingham making that connection 
that Crispus Attucks, who was killed in Boston, was this guy from Framingham. That's Prince Younger's son. Um, and Prince Younger was a well-known figure. Uh, but I have seen no sources that indicate that people in Framingham claimed Attucks as one of their own, identified mm. with him in any way, or that his father, or the person we're, we're thinking was plausibly his father, uh, was in any way connected with that event. So that, that does present kind of a disconnect that I, that, that's puzzling uh, if yeah. we're going to stick with this narrative about his family. And also, I mean, you know, one thing to consider is, you know, do you really want to say that that was my son? Because, you know, at that time period, you have to understand it was two, there was two ends of the spectrum. There were people that were for revolution and there were a lot of people that were still loyalists and people who are loyalists probably viewed this event as, oh, wow, these guys are real evil, bad people. They attacked the British soldiers and got killed. I mean, What's wrong with these guys? You know, so, you know, if if Prince, if his father knew, would he really want to claim like, hey, that's my that's my boy. He ran <laughs> away and caused all this ruckus in Boston. That's my son, everybody. So, you know, I think that maybe that's another reason why. Yep. Um, okay, sorry to keep bringing chat questions, but there's some good ones out there, so we're gonna um, go with a few more. Um, Mitch, can you talk a little bit more about the trial of the soldiers um, and Adams's defense? Because um, there's sort of two two trials in play, right? Yeah. There's, well, there, yeah. There's well, the trial of the the captain who is commanding the soldiers and the trial of the soldiers themselves. And I, I mean, in terms of Adams's defense, I tend to conflate the two uh, in terms of what his strategy was. And Christmas Addicts was central to his strategy. Um, uh, he was, you know, his goal was to uh, make the case that these soldiers were acting in self-defense. They had no choice but to fire. This was a mob that was threatening them. They were throwing chunks of ice and rocks and clubs and shouting all kinds of uh, abuse at them. And Christmas Addicts himself was identified uh, by several witnesses as someone who was shouting at the soldiers, daring them to fire, uh, calling them names. You know, again, the one person uh, indicating that he actually struck at one of the soldiers with this sturdy club that he was carrying. Um, and uh, John Adams portrayed him in that way, that he was a person, I, a, a, a rough paraphrases, a person whose very looks was enough to terrify anyone. Um, that was Addicts. And he, he said that this mob, to call them a mob is, is too respectable for them. Uh, he was really, and he was also characterizing the mob as not the good people of Boston. These were outsiders. They were these sailors, addicts in Caldwell. There was this uh, mm -hmm. Irishman, uh, Patrick Carr, who was known to be a, a, a violent extremist back in Ireland. And he's saying that there are these people from the outside, and this person in particular, this mixed race person, he referred to him as an addicts from Framingham, which two Bostonians would have connected him with that native community there and also identifying as, as a mulatto. Uh, and and that's, the that's the term that was used most consistently throughout the trial, referring to him as the mulatto, the mulatto, not even using his name in a lot of, of circumstances. Uh, so that, that was Addicts's, or I'm, I'm sorry, John Adams's strategy was to really characterize this mob and Addicts in particular as dangerous outsiders who were a threat to the social order, and and he was effective. I mean, however, we we, uh, we should we talk about his um, journal entry, right. right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so can I just pop in with something yeah. on what you just okay. said? So I think there's Adams has in some ways a double defense strategy. So he's fulfilling his lawyerly role of defending the soldiers, but in addition to that. Um, he understands that at that moment in time, the town is on trial because with the Boston Massacre, everything blew up and the city leaders stopped and went, ooh, not sure we're really ready to go down this road. So they're trying to restore their relationship with Britain. And one of the fastest ways to do that is to disown the violence. So from an, arg from an argument standpoint, to make it all about addicts and the other outsiders um, helps to portray that it's not the town's fault whatsoever. So I think that's the other 
the other piece of it. But yeah, Miranda, let's let's talk about John Adams' diary entry a few years after casting at, casting addicts as the villain. Mm, I mean, I just I. <laughs> I don't have the exact words, but basically he said that addicts is encapsulates the American spirit almost, and that he's a name to be respected. Respected, and it was it was a, it was high, it was praise, high praise. It was high praise. <laughs> yeah, for this person who, in front of you know a, a jury, had said um, he was a mulatto rabble rouser. Um, yeah. And I just can't I can't let this moment pass without touching into the tenor of the day right now that we live in where victims are, are, are by taking the narrative and making the deceased or the, um, the person on trial look like the bad guy, look like mm -hmm. the rabble rouser, look like um, the gangster, look like, uh, just put that X in. Yep. It's, it's the ultimate diversion because it takes the um, one's, attention off of what actually happened and brings it to these bigger, grander themes that often are used to uh, reiterate things we want to think about this society. And, oh my gosh, it's all great, but that, that group, you know, and, you know, and um, the police are fine, that guy. And, I, and it's just, I mean, this, this is happening. It just, it, it obviously taps into human nature, right? Because it's happening then, it's happening now. And the question is, when are we as a, an educated group of people going to say, well, wait a minute, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. That has nothing to do with the issue. Um, and I just think it's really interesting that, unfortunately, there was nothing in Crispus Attic's own words about his experience. That's why we have these conversations and that it's reimagining addicts because we, we only have the, the historical facts leading to him and then we, we work within that. However, Adams was just he had a lot of words, you know, and, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, he gets to be a real person because he has journal entries and, you know, everybody has this idea of who Adams was. And to me, the fact that he spoke about that mob one way and then in his private diaries was pretty much lauding addicts for his act says so much about, um, I think, the complexities and the deception in this mm -hmm. idea, even of what we are as Americans right? Like, and what this country is about and what we were founded on. Uh, it, it's, it's such a s specific, almost poetic example of the dissonance yeah. that we are feeling today. And I, Rashid, I see you leaning in. <laughs> the thing that's, but you know, the thing that's so interesting about the trial, and uh, I'm happy Mitch hit on some of the words that were used, is that people have to really, um, put themselves in the mindsets of colonists in this time. Mm -hmm. Black people and Native American people, there's a mindset. The Native Americans are literally terrorists at that time to, mm -hmm. to white people. And I'm gonna tell you why, because the French and Indian War. You, many people were veterans of that war. Uh, many people have heard stories of that war. And you know, to the Native Americans credit, they, they were not too nice to, to, the, to the colonists um, during that war. So people have that, in their minds and you know even studying the formulations of militias they were to protect themselves against these imminent in their minds um native american attacks that may happen to their town so you know that's one aspect and then the african aspect is there were still memories of slave revolt they've been happening pre um 1770s and some of them have been very serious and that whole idea of one day that the blacks are gonna rise up and kill us all for what we have done to them, those things resonate. So when I'm, <laughs> if I'm John Adams and I'm in a trial, I'm gonna say, yeah, he was a mulatto. So guess what? Not only was he black, but he was Native American too. And you know how we feel about these people when they get to that position of violence. So obviously, and you know, the other thing is you're six one. You're coming in a time where people are five five. Are small. You know, you're six one angry black man. We're club. <laughs> you know, that's 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 a very horrific sight to many people. So I think it's very interesting. And also, you know, the John Adams flip flop, he's a politician. I guess, you know, you go with the winning team at the end of the day. You know, we wink, won wink, this politician, revolution. wink wink. Pay attention. <laughs> we won the revolution. <laughs> we won the revolution. So, you know, hey, this guy's pretty good. But uh, uh, at that time, you know, so it, it, I think it's a very fascinating narrative of, I, I guess, the view 
of, of, of individuals who come from those ethnicities at that particular time. And, I, and, I, and, and it's very fascinating to see how that was hammered in. And if you really think about it, that is one of the reasons why the soldiers were, they got off. They were mm -hmm. by this big black man and they had to defend themselves. Yeah. Makes sense to the jury. Mm -hmm. Still makes sense to juries to this day. Let me, I'd like to touch on a couple of points. That, that Adam's diary entry that, that Miranda mentioned that was from 1773, that doesn't seem to have been intended as a public document. It, 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 was, it, was, it was in the form of a letter in his diary that there's no evidence it was ever crafted as a letter and sent you know, to the governor. But basically it was a listing of uh, some of the you know, quote, quote, atrocities of the British soldiers and uh, you know, based, again, paraphrasing, saying you know, the governor of Massachusetts, you have a lot to answer for, and it was signed Crispus Attucks. So he, it wasn't that he publicly lauded Attucks or praised him, and, and there's no evidence that any of the so-called founding fathers uh, uh, were even aware of Attucks, let alone praising him. I, well, you've seen those things coming into stories over the years too. But you know, in terms of uh, Rashid's and, and Miranda's points uh, about you know, bringing Attucks' story to, what, what, what does it bring us to the present day? I'm reminded of, of, of a couple of quotations from, uh, well, one from the early 2000s, a very eminent uh, historian of revolutionary America, Pauline Meyer. Uh, there was a controversy in Framingham over whether or not to name a bridge for Crispus Attucks. And in the context of some of the public discussion, Meyer was consulted and she is quoted as saying, and this is a pretty close paraphrase, well, Attucks is, uh, has been identified as someone who is leading uh, 20 or 30 soldiers uh, carrying clubs. Sounds like a thug to me, right? So that really resonates in a very negative way. More recently, in the aftermath of Michael Brown's uh, murder in uh, uh, Ferguson, Missouri, 2014, uh, political uh, uh, journalist Amy Goodman uh, made a commentary about this on March 5th, 2015, saying something to the effect that uh, comparing Crispus Attucks, a large black man, with Michael Brown, a large black man. And her, her comment was, uh, the concluding comment was, uh, you never know what will spark a revolution and Black Lives Matter. So addicts does resonate in, in multiple ways. And that's, I mean, that's a really interesting thing. This, this trope of the violent large black man that is so persistent in American society. And, and we're certainly seeing it today. You know, addicts kind of fits into that characterization in interesting ways. Uh, and it's, yeah. <laughs> something to think about something to think about um fantastic any other quick parting remarks our time is amazingly almost at an end it flies by but any other thoughts about why why addicts matters today or what's one thing that you would love to ask addicts if you were sitting here with us right now i would say that you know one thing to note is that the american revolution started with the sacrifice of a black man and ended with a sacrifice of a black man. It started with Crispus Attucks' sacrifice of his life um, for, at the time it wasn't the cause of liberty, but it was, it was a fight against oppression. And it ended with a, a black spy named James Lafayette Armistad, who was a dual spy um, in General Gage's camp, but he worked for uh, Marquis de Lafayette in Washington, and he provided the intelligence to uh, win the American Revolution at Yorktown. So it's fascinating to see how those two men correlate with each other. One was killed and removed from the historical record. The other one was re-enslaved. Yeah. So it shows that, you know, there has been sacrifices of African-Americans, people of color, Native Americans, Black people in this country. And, you know, it has still, it's still to this day a battle for respect, a battle for um, equity, and you know, a battle for just being, you know, dignified as a human being. So I think when we think about Christmas addicts, that's I believe the most, um, you know, important part of his legacy. A man who gave his life 
for a cause and we look centuries later and people that look like him are still not being respected, um, especially for their sacrifices and birthing one of the greatest nations in human history. Miranda, mention anything else? Okay, it's hard to talk what Rashid just said. <laughs> <laughs> if, if there's anything that I I'd want to learn from Christmas Addicts, if I had the opportunity to speak with him, I, I'd really like to know how he saw himself, how he identified. Did he see himself as a native, as African, as, as a cosmopolitan person of the Atlantic world, as an American? And, you know, and what, what led him into the streets that night? What was it that, that drew him out there to do what he did? But in, in terms of a, a legacy for addicts, it is something that, that I think that, that, that people should think, the ways that, in which people should think about addicts' story. At the time of his death, one out of every five American colonists was of African birth or descent. Fully 21% of the population, you know, smaller percentage in Massachusetts than in South Carolina, but one out of every five Americans was black. And we, we, in our educational system, in our public culture, our, our collective memory, we tend to think of the American colonies and the American Revolutionary uh, era as a very white place, and it wasn't. And the fact that he and other people of color were in the streets uh, on, in Boston on March 5th that night, whether he's a hero or a rabble rouser or, or however he's characterized, these people are out there claiming their place as American colonists, making political statements. They were an integral part of colonial and revolutionary society. And we need to recognize that, that, that diversity of the American population that has always been there. And it's, it's consistently been erased or ignored. Um, I would say as just a parting thought and, and using the themes that I, I the themes and methods and, and ways that I approach the work that I was able to create. Just be careful and listen out for the dehumanization of people. I just think that that's so important because I think that what we are now, we've always been. And, and, and the fact that these things are still happening, at some point, it's only the people that can say, wait a minute, this has to stop, or wait a minute, I'm gonna listen in a different way. So I think the dehumanization of anybody is something that needs to be really, um, we really need to inspect and we need to start taking it personally when those things happen, right? Because when they happen to folks that are separate from us, it, it, it's e and, and, and it happens enough, it's really easy to just turn your, turn your head, close your ears and just say, well, that's not my America, that's not who I am. But um, I think that by not paying attention, we end up uh, repeating what we've always done. Um, and I just think that that's such a problem. So I think just be, be careful. We all need to do that right now. We need to keep our ears open. We need to keep our eyes open and remember that every person that you see flashing across the news was someone's baby. That to me just means a lot. That, that's an in for me. Um, and so I just think that that's something that we all have to do. And we all have a responsibility to do. Absolutely. Um, so we've reached the end of our time. I want to thank um, Miranda, Rashid, and Mitch so much. This has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. Um, if you've enjoyed spending time with our three amazing panelists, there's going to be more opportunities ahead in the short term and the long term uh, to stay in contact. Mitch is going to be back again with us on November 10th for Monumental Attics, where we're going to explore the history of the monument on Boston Common to honor addicts and the other victims of the massacre. So this is gonna be a good opportunity to talk about when monuments bring us together and when they pull us apart. Um, Miranda is, is, as she said, wrapping up her work on I Am This Place. And one of our biggest disappointments in 2020 is not being able to share that due to the social distancing restrictions we're facing. But rest assured, the second circumstances change, you will see that at Old South. Um, in the meantime, if you want to check out something else Miranda's been working on, I encourage you to go check out the Huntington Theater's Dream Boston series of audio plays. Miranda's new work, Virtual Attendance, drops on October 7th, and I can't resist also saying that another work um, in that series by Patrick Gabridge Echoes talks about the Boston Massacre. Um, that play will drop on October 21st. 
Um, Rashid obviously will be back again for another star turn uh, at the massacre reenactment, again, when that's able to happen after social distancing regulations relax. Um, as I mentioned earlier, over the next several months, Reflecting Addicts is going to continue to explore Addicts' legacy. Um, we have another fabulous panel coming up on October 20th, Demanding Freedom, Addicts, and the Abolition Movement. So our speaker lineup is, again, equally fantastic. We're going to have Christopher Bonner of the University of Maryland College Park, an author of Remaking the Republic, Black Politics, and the Creation of American Citizenship. Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley College, an author of Force and Freedom, Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence. Um, and Steve Kennerwitz of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an author of More Than Freedom, Fighting for Black Citizenship in a White Republic. So we encourage you to check out our website at revolutionaryspaces.org to learn more about those events. We also have another event coming up on October 6th. We'll be live streaming a performance of history at plays um, I now pronounce you Lucy Stone. Stone was a 19th century women's rights activist and abolitionist. So if you're not already, sign up for our newsletter um, and follow us on social media at Rev Spaces to stay in touch with everything we're up to. Thank you again for coming. Hope to see you next time. And until then, be well. Mm -hmm.